Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome to this month edition of the DSSC Insight Series, the monthly webinar appointment uh, from the Data Spaces Support Center. So this month, we're very happy to bring you two key topics from our community. The first one is we will unveil the Data Space Support Center toolbox, and then we will talk about the key role played by open data in building common European data spaces. So specifically, we will talk about, this is how the agenda will look like today. So we'll have an introduction uh, from Gian Gianfranco Cecconi, the executive director of the Data Spaces Support Center. We'll then follow up with a presentation on the Data Space Support Center toolbox and the validation scheme by Michael Storbrink and uh, from, from TNO and Sonia Jimenez from uh, the International Data Spaces Association. Following that, we will, we will uh, explore what can open data do for common European data spaces with a presentation from Elena Simple, professor, uh, professor of Computer Science at King's College London and Director of Research at the Open Data Institute. And also with Marcin Barin, the Deputy Head of Unit for EU Open Data at the Publication Office of the European Union at the European Commission. Following that, we will have a Q&A session. Just a note, you will, you will also have the, the chance to ask question during the webinar in the, in the, the, drop, in the chat box at the bottom right of, of, the, of the webinar. You will know uh, any, and we will try to address all the questions as they go. Any unanswered question will, 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 will be dealt with at the very end. So um, just a few housekeeping items. So this webinar is recorded. Um, if you want to watch uh, all the previous DSSC Insight series recording, you can do so on our YouTube channel. In order to add, you can scan the QR code in this slide to ask uh, to access to our YouTube channel. And there you will also find the videos from the Data Space Symposium 2024. And then we will, uh, last point before I hand out the floor to, to Gianfranco, uh, we, um, you can always stay up to date with, uh, with everything that the Data Space Support Center does by subscribing to our DSSC newsletter. Uh, you, can, you can click on the link here and scan the QR code on the slides. So uh, without further ado, I leave the floor to Gianfranco for the introduction. Gianfranco, this is, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever you are in Europe or in the world. Uh, as Anna introduced me well, my name is Gianfranco Cicconi. I'm the International Data Spaces Association Chief Solution Officer, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Data Spaces Support Center. Uh, for Project Coordinator Professor Boris Otto that you met in previous episodes of this webinar, uh, of the many partners in our team and at your service as our users. Uh, I will be your host for today together with Anna. Um, a couple of months ago, uh, the Data Space Support Center reached an important milestone for us. It was our uh, birthday, so to speak. It was our one year and a half birthday. Uh, why is it important? It's a milestone associated with the first significant review of our work uh, by our friends at the European Commission, who entrusted us with running these initiatives for you. In addition to all the input we have received uh, from, from you, from our audience since the beginning of our work, uh, I'm pleased to share that we have also passed that moment of review. The feedback was uh, refreshingly positive. The team feels energized and ready uh, with renewed strength and commitment uh, for what expects us in the next two years. Among the feedback we received probably since the very beginning was the request to try being as pragmatic as possible in providing guidance um, that is, you may say, shovel ready, something that you can take and implement straight away. Uh, making you happy is not always possible because the topic we deal with is still very new. Some data space practices and technology are still in development. And if you're in Europe, even the supporting legislation like the Data Act will enter into force only in September next year. At the same time, we are getting there. Uh, today, uh, we will be talking about one of the new services of the Data Spaces Support Center that goes in that direction. Uh, colleague Sonia Jimenez of the International Data Spaces Association and, and Mikiel Stornebrink of the NO will present what we call the toolbox. I, I don't want to spoil it for you, uh, but let me just share that the toolbox uh, will be the long awaited missing link uh, between, uh, on one side, uh, the functional description of building blocks and components that you find in the blueprint. And on the other side, uh, the physical world made of legal agreements, software services that you will need to use to build a data space or to join one. 
the toolbox will offer you a catalog of the tools you need. That is what the fruition part of the title of today's Inside Series is, the, the free flow of data from source uh, to fruition. Uh, what about the sources instead? If a data space, uh, were, if data spaces uh, had a recipe, uh, many ingredients would go in it. Uh, some of which are classics like uh, open data, and not all data needs to be confidential and protected. Open data is indeed data that can be freely used, reused, and redistributed by anyone, subject only at most to the requirement to attribute its source. Governments are among the biggest providers of open data sets, also thanks to the European Union, which has promoted the practice among its member states since the early 2000s and created dedicated legislation to support them. Professor Lena Simper of King's College London and Marcin Barin of the Publications Office of the European Union will tell us more about this. Uh, following up uh, on a successful session on the same topic they offered at the Data Spaces Support Center's last symposium in March. So if you missed our event, this is an opportunity for you to catch up. To close, I invite you uh, to celebrate with me how lucky we are for the decades of effort of the unsung heroes, including the pioneers who advocated for open data first, that have enabled us to put data sharing to work and whom we owe where we are today. The Data Space Support Center stands proud on the shoulders of giants, so to speak. So I will be with you for the rest of the event uh, and with the team, we will be available to address your questions at the end of the webinar. But for now, uh, let's open the toolbox and see what's inside. Uh, Sonia and Mikia, uh, please tell us more. Thanks very much, uh, Gianfranco, for already introducing um, uh, the topic of the toolbox. Uh, let me quickly check with you if, if you can see my screen. I think you do. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, yeah? OK. Um, uh, a good day um, uh, for um, uh, Sonia and myself opportunity to tell you a bit more about uh, the toolbox already mentioned by uh, Gianfranco. I will start uh, with uh, explaining what it is, uh, what the purpose of it is, and then uh, Sonia will take over to uh, tell us on the, the validation part on how to uh, get implementations in the toolbox. Um, maybe to give uh, two practical examples of what we from the DSSC mean by tools or implementations, those things that, that get into the toolbox. And um, for that, I mean, you're probably all familiar with uh, the, the notion of building blocks as being described in the DSCC blueprint. And uh, as of the first release, version 1.0, there's for the technical components, of, or for the technical building blocks, also a list of components, data space components that you need to set up and run a data space. For example, a participant agent, also known as a, a data space connector. And we see many, many of implementations already out there, both open source and uh, proprietary uh, solutions, commercial solutions that implement such a participant agent. And so this is an example of what we mean by tools, by implementations that can get into the toolbox uh, to, be, uh, to, be, to be listed there. Uh, another example from um, a uh, business and organizational perspective, so, so to say the green building blocks in the DCC blueprint, there we see a building block that's called contractual framework. I'm reading from right to left here. Uh, and although not, not yet part of the current version of the blueprint, but we foresee also a specification of components that uh, provide these um, these um, uh, these functionalities as described in the building blocks for the well the, so to say the non-technical building blocks as well let's say for example a data product contract template uh, that you can use to to offer your services your data products and then there are again different implementations possible where um, uh, where these contractual uh, contract templates are being provided uh, like for example the CTR rulebook Template number nine in particular, which sets the data set terms of use. 
this is these are just two examples of what we think of in terms of uh, tools. And I will come with uh, a few um, um, uh, well um, uh, limitations on on uh, our, our scope definition of these uh, these tools in a bit. Here, visually represented, how we think, how we see that these implementations in the toolbox link to the to the specifications as provided by the blueprint. On the top layer, you see the uh, depicted the the building blocks in our blueprint. Then in the middle, part of integral part of the blueprint are the overview of the components, those a limited list that we think these are the essentials to, to set up a data space. And then uh, 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 a large toolbox with implementations uh, that exist out there. So let's, let's look at this toolbox from a data space participant perspective. Why do you need a toolbox? And we think that to set up and participate in data spaces, you need solutions. You don't start um, uh, creating software from uh, from scratch. You can you you want to have an overview of what's already out there, what's ready to use, what you can pick up and and start uh, uh, integrating or implementing with. Uh, and at the same time, we see that there are already many data space solutions out there, and sometimes it's hard to see the forest for the trees. Um, hidden in nice GitHub repositories, or maybe provided on other websites or initiatives that that exist. Um, and there, um, uh, the DSCC thinks um, uh, the toolbox can can help out with uh, with uh, providing such an overview. And finally, uh, at this moment, uh, well, any solution can say, well, we adhere to the DSC guidance, uh, both the blueprint and other principles defined by the DSC. Um, uh, and uh, but how are you sure about that? And how do you select a future proof uh, a solution? So that this is why we, uh, from a DSC perspective, will provide a curated catalog of these implementations. Moving to the other perspective, so as a solution provider, why do you want to have your uh, your solution in there? Well, more or less like the yellow pages, uh, being listed in the toolbox allows for improved findability by potential users, and and um, the um, uh, the the link of the implementations in the toolbox with the building blocks, as defined by the blueprint, will also better position your solution in terms of uh, well, terminology uh, uh, being commonly used in the in the in the area of data spaces. So here, the toolbox, a curated catalog of implementations, and we say it's open for any implementation that adheres to the DSC blueprint, and that requires validation. More on that later by uh, by Sonia. Um, a few scoping uh, rules. Um, um, just to be sure, it covers both the technical and also the non-technical uh, support tools. So it's not limited to software only. It includes both software and non-software, like, like I said, um, and uh, also open source and proprietary solutions. There's no limitation on, uh, on that. And um, anyone can submit a tool to be listed in the, in the toolbox. It can be the owner or the maintainer of the tool can be an open source initiative that does that, but also individual data space enthusiasts who think, well, this is a really nice solution I'm using and others might benefit from that as well. You can also um, uh, register um, uh, uh, tools created by others. As we said in Blueprint version 1.0, there's a list of technical components that we now identified including a catalog, um, a data space wallet, a vocabulary hub, and already mentioned the participant agents, also known as the data space connector. And this is for phase one, we open up the, the listing of, uh, of these kind of implementations. Um, we do want to make a note here because at this moment, an alignment is taking place with the simple initiative who's also working on the data space architecture uh, and the implementation and several implementations. 
to align this this overview of data space components so that it will be uh, well. Um, uh, uh, so and uh, uh, what I want to mention is that for the for the next version of the blueprint uh, one dot five we expect to have a, a slightly updated overview of these uh, these components. And furthermore, a overview of uh, the the uh, uh, non technical components will also follow in the next release of the blueprint. The toolbox, we expect to release a first version of it uh, during the autumn, after summer. And the uh, and our current idea, we're, we're working hard on, on getting this done. Our current idea is to extend the data space radar functionality for this by adding implementations next to, as, a, as an artifact in the, in the radar, next to the current list of the data space initiatives. Um, this, this tool, will allow to filter, search, and find the tools in the toolbox, and potentially also be able to link them to the data space initiative. So you can see, ah, this and this data space is actually using this and this set of, um, of uh, implementations. So our call to action now is to please submit um, um, uh, the implementations that you want to have uh, uh, in the first uh, release of the toolbox. That leaves the question, how does that work? A short overview, you can go to the request form at the DSCC support um, uh, website. Uh, a link is here provided in as part of the uh, webinar sheets. You can find it as well in the on the DSCC website. There you can submit a request um, to list implementations in the toolbox. You will be asked to fill in a form with some metadata about the implementation, who created it, what is the uh, readiness of the, is it already being used in, in data space initiative and, and, and more of these kind of metadata um, uh, parts. And after that, after you submitted that, you will be contacted to provide a self-assessment where you can validate uh, whether that implementation complies with the DSC blueprint. More on that by Sonia. And if all goes well, we will include the um, implementation in the first release of the toolbox. That's it from my side. I would hand over the floor to, uh, to Sonia. Now, thank you, Michiel. I will now share my screen. So um, now you've seen what the toolbox is and why it is important, why we need it. And my goal to the, now is to explain um, this part. So you might be wondering if uh, all implementations will go directly into the toolbox. So short answer is no, as you've seen. Um, so how are implementations listed then? And um, in order to have only curated implementations in the toolbox, we have developed a validation scheme. Um, so the DSSC will deliver this validation and approval framework uh, for the implementations, both for the technical, but also for the business and organizational ones. It will be carried out through uh, automated self-assessments. And uh, these self-assessments will be aligned with the blueprint, um, um, with the specifications of uh, the building blocks um, that can be found in the blueprint. Regarding the content of the self-assessment, so we will have some more generic data. So regarding implementation metadata, some examples you can see um, here, but then we, we will have some specific questions um, about the implementations, okay? So um, generic data that we need also to be able to filter out the, um, and make it easier for others to find the right implementations. And then specific questions regarding the components uh, that were shown previously. And with both types of information, we will create a self-assessment for every component. And then the implementations that successfully complete the self-assessment um, will be listed in the toolbox. And why are we doing this? So what, which are the benefits of this validation scheme? 
we have uh, different types of participants. So we try to think where are the benefits uh, for uh, them. So first for solution providers, they will be able to assess their technical components against the blueprint specifications to see if they are um, compliant to what the DSSC has defined in the blueprints. And they also have the advantage that if they are compliant, they will be, the implementations will be listed in the toolbox uh, for other participants to find. In the case of data space authorities, um, they can check, they can assess if their um, alignment, if their data space um, is aligned to the organizational and business um, building blocks. And in the case of um, data space participants in, in general, they will have this catalog of curated and validated implementations in the toolbox. Here you have an overview of the validation process. So for the applicant, the way to prepare for this is to check the blueprint, um, the specifications there and, and see if um, the, um, the implementation is um, compliant, is meeting the requirements of the specifications. Um, in the case, if this is the case, they can apply for this validation. Um, and um, if they uh, submit this, um, if they fill out this uh, self-assessment, and um, everything is right, and we check and they are compliant, their implementation will be published, um, as Michiel explained, in um, this kind of format using the uh, radar. So we are in charge of publishing this, but we're also in charge of the maintenance. And this is a, an important point because we will have new versions of the blueprint. That means we will update specifications we need to make sure that all the self-assessments comply with these specifications, so with the latest version of the blueprint. Um, and we also need to make sure that in the, tool, in the toolbox, um, you are able to find um, to which um, blueprint version this um, implementation is compliant. So this is uh, on the DSSC side. So we will be in charge of this roadmap and the maintenance of the validation scheme. Okay, and that be it from my side. And then I can over um, back to Anna. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Michiel. Uh, I see um, see a few mov some movement in the chat. Please keep asking the questions. And um, and then I will then I'll be very happy to move over to the open data part of this webinar which is what can open data do for the common European data spaces. Uh, I am sharing the screen right now. Yeah, all good. Perfect. So Elena, thank you for joining us. And also thank you for Marcin and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm very glad to be here. Um, data sharing um, has been a very important topic for myself. Um, in my academic career, a few years back, I um, led a European project called Data Pitch. Um, it was a three years um, project, which I think was possibly one of the first ones um, that we were, that the European Commission was, was, was looking to fund to understand uh, technical, legal, operational bottlenecks in sharing data. Um, so at the time we had set up a an innovation program to bring together startups who um, built products and services with uh, shared data and uh, various types of data holders. Um, in uh, my other role at the as director of research at the Open Data Institute. Um, I am very much working on a number of inter interdisciplinary projects across the data spectrum. Um, those of you who um, have never heard of uh, the Open Data Institute, um, we are a, a non-for-profit uh, that was founded by um, one of those giants that um, Gianfranco referred to at the beginning uh, of this webinar. Uh, so this year we've been celebrating the 35th anniversary of the web, um, which was created, as probably you know, by, by Sir 
Tim Berners-Lee. He's one of the founders of the Open Data Institute alongside Nigel Chatwell. Um, and open data is, 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 is linked to the web in, 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 in many ways um, with movements like linked data, which, which refer to a stack of technologies that um, allowed one to publish data in a way that made it as reusable as possible, as easy as possible to use from a technical point. So that's um, also the reason why, that's one of the reasons why I was so happy to, to, to come back after um, the event in, in, in Darmstadt in March, which was absolutely fantastic, and um, talk about um, what I think is or should be the relationship between these two communities, open data on the one hand and data sharing data spaces on the other. Uh, next slide, please. Um, possibly some of you know this, but it's worth reiterating what open data is. Uh, open data is data that anyone can access, use, and share. That means that um, in the terms of use or the license of the data, there are no limitations on how the data will be used. Um, also worth noting that it is not exactly the same as data being in the public domain. Like, for instance, when we're talking about social media platforms or any platform in the scope of the Data Services Act, we talk about public domain content. That's not the same as, as openly licensed um, data. Um, and the final observation on the slide is that free to use does not have to mean free to access. Um, free to use um, refers to restrictions on, on, on use cases, commercial or otherwise. Uh, free to access um, means the, the the costs or acknowledges that there may be costs and resources associated with with the access. On the right hand side on the slide is one of the um, things that the Open Data Institute is, is most known for in the data community, the so-called data spectrum, where um, drawing on a number of research and client projects, um, we have um, aimed to explain the different means of, of, of access and levels of access in, 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 in data, um, including open data on the right-hand side, and then transitioning to shared and closed. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there's a lot of open data out there. Uh, so Google Dataset Search, um, which is a major um, search engine for data sets specifically, indexed a few years ago, uh, more than 45 million of them. Um, there's a lot of open data in science, um, owing to initiatives like EOSC and, and, and uh, um, others, uh, the Research Data Alliance, for instance, um, but also in government, as you will hear uh, from my fellow speaker later on. But that's not all. Industry is also making um, data openly available or is taking existing data and providing um, openly available accessible services on top of it to make it easier to use. On the right hand side on the slide, there are examples of um, the data spectrum of the ODI uh, from the various sectors in which we're operating. Uh, some are associated with public services, um, maybe um, water and, and energy or, or, or agriculture, uh, but in all of these sectors, there's also many examples of, of success stories of uh, private entities uh, sh uh, sharing data openly with no restrictions for use to boost innovation um, and increase their customer base uh, or for social responsibility or regulatory reasons. Next slide, please. Um, there's substantial economic and social value associated with it. Um, so I've quoted here on the slide work that was done by Data Europa uh, to assess the impact of um, of open data. Uh, but there's that that type of values created more broadly um, worldwide. Um, so the UN and other global organizations um, frequently attest this, um, and also. In uh, the, the, the EU, we're talking about data sets that are considered particularly valuable, um, so high value data sets that uh, Martin will, will, will probably touch upon. 
Uh, next slide, please. Um, now everyone's talking about AI. A lot of advances in AI um, are open. So going back to that open science uh, and open science principles that I mentioned earlier, modern AI, both in an academic, but also in a corporate environment, runs on open data sets. Lots of benchmarks in AI are openly available. And these are some statistics from the ML Commons Associate, Association. So they're, the blue parts um, in those pie charts are openly available data sets. Um, on the right-hand side, um, I'm quoting um, an initiative called the Data Provenance Explorer, which among other things has looked at the different types of licenses available in, in AI data sets as well. Next slide. Um, so now related to uh, some, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about um, some research I've been doing at King's College um, and some of the work of the Open Data Institute um, that I feel is particularly pertinent in, for data sharing and for data spaces as well. Uh, and I'm going to start with something that is very close to my heart, and that is the tenant of user centricity in data publishing, whether that publish publishing happen, happens openly or whether we're talking about a scenario in which an entity is sharing data um, in a network of trusted parties, the same thing applies. User centricity is key to realize um, the, the, the value of, 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 of that data in that ecosystem. Um, so in um, together with my colleague, Joanna Walker, we have um, done some research to establish 10 principles for um, data publishing platforms, whether they're open or, or closed uh, to a trusted share of, uh, to a trusted network of, of uh, organizations um, that are likely to um, make that data more usable across a number of use cases. If we go to the next slide, I think I have also included um, the principles um, um, as, as text. Um, I'm not gonna go through them um, because I don't have a lot of time. Uh, but essentially, they provide guidance for designers of, of, of data platforms um, to make sure that people can find the data and make sense of it and have that confidence to use it um, with as little friction as possible. And then what we have done on the next slide um, is we've, we've spoken to a number of data publishers to try to operationalize those 10 principles and come up with uh, five points um, tiered system to explain uh, how they could increase the um, implementation or implementability of each of those uh, principles. On the next slide, I have just one of the 10 examples. For instance, we're encouraging data publishers to think about organizing their data collections for or data catalogs for use. Um, and we explain what it means. Uh, so from accompanying uh, the data set uh, by, by, by metadata all the way to adding keywords from data sets that are linked to other published data sets. Next slide. Um, in the open data ecosystem, particularly at the ODI, there's also a huge arsenal of methods you could draw on. Um, for instance, there's tools uh, like the data ecosystem mapping or tools that encourage one to reflect on the ethics of data sharing and use, or in fact, a risk assessment workbook where organizations can decide what is the level of access that they want for their data sets. It could be open, it could be shared, um, or it could be in fact closed. Um, so lots of these methods and the toolkits associated with them um, are possibly relevant also for the toolkit that we have heard about earlier. Next slide, please. Um, very briefly, a number of of um, original research pieces, and I'm going to 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 wrap up very quickly. Um, so I've I've grouped them into insights about about data publishing and then use. So for publishing, we've done, for instance, research looking at missing data sets. Uh, so there's there's millions and millions of open government data sets, but there's also blind spots. For instance, um, across the along the digital divide, uh, in rural areas. We've done a lot of research uh, trying to understand the link between publishing and use across a number of potentially unknown uh, use cases. And we have provided actual evidence that those 10 principles I've mentioned earlier lead to more user engagement with data. Next slide. Um, and then we have done 
Oh, sorry. This is a, this is a work in progress, but never mind. Um, so you can see a little bit behind the scenes in the title. Um, so there is more research, as you can see in the title, but the papers I have listed here essentially look at how people search for data. Um, so that could apply to data catalogs as well. Um, and what you could do to improve um, what happens next? So once a, uh, once you search in a data catalog and you have a list of data sets, how do you allow someone to understand which of those data sets is relevant to them without downloading them? And that's for shared data is even more important because you don't actually have access sometimes to, to, to the data. Just to um, wrap up, uh, we're going to the next slide. Um, uh, a few um, things that, that, that people sometimes ask me when I talk about open versus shared data. Open data is not necessarily centralized. We know we have this, this, this idea that uh, a publisher, like public authority, goes and, and puts the data on a, on a portal. Um, there's decentralized forms of open data publishing as well, which are potentially more akin to data spaces architectures. Next slide. Um, we have a lot of interesting information about use and impact, including methods which would transfer to data sharing scenarios. Next slide. Um, so, so now um, moving on to, to, to what Martin is going to say, um, I think to conclude, we have more than 15 years of experience and a huge body of data and methods, standards, and so on that everyone can use, um, shared, Oh, and open data have similar goals. We noticed that open data publishing starts by sharing data internally or with trusted partners. There's common challenges as well on the technical and legal side. Um, and, lots of, and lots of use cases require both shared and open data. And I'm gonna leave you with um, one final slide with some things that are, are we could consider doing um, uh, jointly, ranging from knowledge and technology transfer um, at, and knowledge exchange, uh, but also looking at harmonization with key open data sets, in particular high value ones, to reduce the costs of integration and leveled playing field. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. Uh, I hand the floor now to, to Marcin. Marcin. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you, Gianfranco, Anna, and uh, colleagues for inviting uh, me to participate in this uh, webinar. It's uh, it's a pleasure and privilege uh, at the same time. Um, and uh, I absolutely join Elena's thoughts about um, Darmstadt and uh, the need of continuing our discussion um, between the world of open data and uh, the world of uh, data spaces. Uh, because as we've noticed um, in the past, uh, sometimes this conversation, or very often, I should say, this conversation could be beneficial for both um, sides. And uh, uh, only if we know what we can offer to each other, uh, then uh, we will know how we can really cooperate and bring uh, bigger added value at, uh, at a smaller cost at the same time. Uh, so uh, thank you for having this uh, opportunity again to uh, to speak about uh, open data. Um, I was already introduced, so I will not say uh, much. I represent the Publications Office of the European Union, which is uh, a part of uh, the European Commission administratively. Um, and uh, behind, so one of the tasks of the Publications Office is to uh, run the Data Europa EU uh, portal, which is the official portal for European data. Um, and I will say a couple of words um, in the next slide um, about what we are um, offering. Uh, so as you can see, in a big nutshell, uh, our services are related, of course, first of all, to data, uh, as we offer access uh, to um, quite some data sets, uh, which will be uh, shown later. Um, but we also go, if we look at the um, famous uh, pyramid, um, we also go uh, to the next level of um, information and we also uh, try to focus quite much on the knowledge. And that's why we run the um, Data Europa Academy, 
um, where we try to share knowledge from the field of open data, but also generally um, uh, concerning data, which might be very useful uh, also for your communities. And I will speak a bit more um, later about this. Um, of course, open data is also a community or uh, even different communities um, or sub-communities. Uh, we organize different conferences, webinars uh, ourselves. Now we are super happy to participate uh, in this one and join uh, forces. Um, uh, and uh, of course, uh, open data uh, is present in so many countries. Um, I'm talking now, of course, from the perspective of Data Europa EU, um, because uh, I, I will not speak uh, globally. Um, so on, on Data Europa EU, uh, there are 35 uh, countries uh, which provide um, data. Um, which is uh, which is quite the number, uh, and which also shows that this is not limited to the European Union. Uh, of course, uh, looking at uh, at this, um, but also to other uh, European countries which want to participate uh, in this initiative and want to f um, share their um, open data uh, with others or give this uh, possibility. Uh, then, last but not least, um, publications. Uh, we issue the open data maturity uh, reports every single year, uh, where there are comparisons and um, Mm, lots of information uh, related to the progress in that field in uh, different countries. Uh, but we also offer uh, lots of different other reports. Elena mentioned some examples um, in uh, her presentation uh, already. Uh, so I, I could only invite you to, uh, to have a look um, at the resources which we have um, on our website. In the next slide, you will see the number of uh, data sets uh, which we currently have. In Darmstadt, I was speaking about 1.6 million. Uh, now I'm happy to announce 1.7 million. Um, we uh, Actually, it's above 1.7 million right now. Um, and those data sets are grouped in 185 data catalogs. And that comes from the fact that uh, different countries, uh, apart from having the centralized uh, open data um, portals, they also uh, might have separate uh, geo portals. Uh, then there are also, of course, the EU institutions um, sources, uh, and there might be additional uh, data sets in different um, countries. Um, of course, with this amount of data, uh, if not the different search and navigation uh, possibilities, uh, one would be uh, totally lost. Therefore, we offer uh, different uh, possibilities to search, different filters, uh, also uh, the possibility to query the data via the SparkQL endpoint um, and accessing it via uh, APIs. Next slide, please. What might be very interesting uh, for quite some of you is the metadata translations. So the um, actually all the metadata we have, uh, they are in all EU languages. And then also for other texts, we uh, translate, uh, we have machine translation uh, to uh, also other languages. Um, there is a possibility of uh, transforming, downloading um, uh, data sets, uh, getting visualizations uh, for uh, geo data sets, and that uh, might be something which might be uh, potentially um, a feature which might be potentially reused by uh, some of you. I will mention it uh, later. Um, what we really are proud of is the possibility of uh, giving direct feedback on the metadata uh, quality. Uh, so the providers might uh, immediately check whether their uh, uh, data metadata is um, of sufficient quality and whether which elements are uh, possibly missing, what they can improve, and they they can um, try it after improving their data sets. Uh, they can uh, try again and uh, see what is the result of it. 
Uh, then there are two other options uh, of uh, embedding and uh, exporting citations, uh, which uh, the last one uh, might be um, especially interesting for researchers, um, as uh, quite much work was uh, put there to, uh, to do it in the proper form. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I've already mentioned at the beginning the Data Europa Academy, uh, and uh, here I would like to spend a minute uh, with you to discuss it. Um, this is something what, with the aim of improving data literacy. Uh, also, when we were in Darmstadt, uh, there were several speakers who were complaining actually on very low uh, data literacy in uh, our uh, society uh, and the need to improve it with all possible means. Um, we try to put a small brick into that building um, of uh, better data literacy by providing different uh, courses, systematic courses. Um, there can be legal, technical, business, visualizations um, related. Um, they, they will have also quite different forms and they will have different levels. So some of them might be uh, too basic for you as um, uh, probably uh, all of you, or if not most of you are uh, specialists uh, in data. Um, but we offer also courses which are on quite um, advanced level and uh, which tackle specific topics. Uh, and those ones might be interesting um, for you um, exactly to, to uh, address uh, um, a concrete um, issue. Um, Gianfranco is saying that not everybody in our audience is an expert, and uh, so so I'm happy I didn't uh, um, say too much, uh, speak too much about uh, the, the courses. Uh, so please feel free to to have a look at our catalog, and uh, especially if you are a non-expert, there is a huge variety of courses for you. If you're an expert, there are still quite some courses which might be uh, useful. And of course, we uh, all the time update, improve um, our offer. So um, it's it's worth to have a look on uh, at it on a regular basis. And of course, all the resources are for free. So uh, that's another uh, interesting uh, part, which might be taken, uh, which should be taken into account. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, apart from open data, uh, about which we uh, talked uh, quite much in the last uh, minutes, um, Data Europa EU offers also uh, the European Register for Protected Data held by the public sector. It's quite a long name, um, which stems from the Data Governance Act, um, where it is uh, written that a searchable electronic register of public uh, sector protected data should be established. Um, we were asked to uh, develop it. It is already there for uh, quite a while, since September last year. And uh, we have the first uh, catalogs and a couple of uh, other um, uh, member states are already in touch with us to uh, include more. Uh, what does it contain? It contains, as the long name says, more or less, um, a register of um, of the data which is held by the public, but uh, which is um, not open. So um, it is protected data. Uh, but thanks to this catalog, uh, anybody can check the existence, at least in those countries which are already uh, plugged to uh, our system. Um, and then on the basis of this, uh, there can be, of course, uh, um, a request to access um, done to the appropriate uh, authorities. Next slide, please. And now the topic which um, Elena mentioned um, already in her slides, so the high value data sets, which is a, a big um, topic in the recent months. Um, the, um, the implementation of uh, the high value data sets uh, is uh, ongoing on Data Europa uh, EU so that we would be able to present it in the, in the proper uh, form. Um, and um, we are 
basically uh, ready um, or getting ready in, with the last uh, pieces of information which are uh, transmitted to us uh, from different uh, countries uh, which would like to have this or that uh, functionality or um, uh, be able to provide data um, in a more specific uh, form. Uh, for those who are not very familiar with the high value data sets um, concept and the implementing regulation, which uh, uh, set the list of them uh, in December 2022, uh, I can just say a few words. So it, this act identified six thematic categories of data sets, uh, which are bringing certain benefits uh, for the society, for the environment, for the economy, and those ones which are listed here um, in the uh, graph. Um, will be uh, should be fully available in on the national uh, portals uh, for open data and at the same time at um, on data um, Europa EU. Next slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned already, uh, we are uh, finishing the implementation phase uh, for us, for Data Europa EU, uh, with still certain conversations uh, ongoing. Um, we want to have it uh, very user friendly and uh, the user centricity, which also Elena spoke uh, quite much of and very nicely about we try to apply as much um, uh, as possible here. So we will see certain features which are not uh, anywhere else on Data Europa EU and which help also uh, be it in graphical form or in a textual form, um, uh, helpful to um, understand what is there and uh, how in an, the easiest way um, all this, all those data sets uh, related to high value data sets um, can be um, fetched and what, uh, what possibly can be done because uh, we will be also, of course, um, speaking about use cases and um, uh, and the ideas of uh, certain uh, reuse and how it was done uh, in the past. Next slide, please. Um, this is the, the final uh, slide where I would like to um, refer to certain features uh, which we have on Data Europa EU and which we think that might be uh, potentially uh, useful uh, for you or for the communities um, within uh, which you operate. Um, so this is just a sample of, uh, of uh, certain elements uh, which we have on uh, GitLab available for reuse by anybody. Uh, and as you can see, we offer the visualization previews, we offer the data harvesting protocols for importing and transforming um, from of data from different sources, and uh, that probably might be uh, particularly useful for certain um, data spaces. Um, also, the data providers uh, interface, um, which uh, helps to input data uh, both manually and uh, via APIs. Uh, the metadata quality assessment tool I already mentioned uh, before, so I will not repeat myself. And then again, the uh, data citation and data embedding uh, features, which uh, might be useful. And uh, these were just a, a couple of uh, tools uh, which um, any of you um, can reuse. So this is uh, my final uh, slide. Um, in the next one, you will just see the thank you and the possibility of contacting us and following uh, what we are doing. Um, uh, once again, uh, big thanks to you, and uh, we hope that uh, what Jen Franco said also at uh, at the beginning, and uh, what I liked very much, that uh, and and later on uh, Elena also referred to this. So this journey of open data, which uh, we have taken um, and which has been ongoing for quite some years, hopefully can be useful, uh, and also the mistakes we made uh, might be useful. Uh, for the building or developing uh, further improving uh, data spaces. Um, and uh, we are 
very happy to share more experiences with you or more uh, go into more detailed conversations. Um, please feel free to contact uh, me, my colleagues. You have the, uh, the info here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Marcin. Thanks again to all the presenters uh, for the interesting presentation. We are now at the Q&A uh, Q phase. I see there's been a little bit of movement in the chat, but I believe uh, Gianfranco addressed all the questions. But I see there is one which just came up, which is which data sets would would they be and how, why would they be integrated? What does that mean? Which are the use cases uh, they can be used as an example? So this question can be, it's for Marcin because it just came up in the chat. So we would probably, I think it's probably related to the, to the last slides, last slides you shared before the thank you slide, of course. Um, would you like to take it? Uh, yes, I'm. I'm trying to understand to uh, to answer the best uh, possible. Um, which data sets? Uh, oh. would, yes, there is another. Ah, another. That, that's about uh, the high value data sets. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, yes, for the moment, as I mentioned, uh, there is uh, no data sets yet. Uh, the implementation is uh, coming now in June uh, as the Data Governance Act um, in that uh, part uh, entered into its application uh, right now. Uh, however, there are still some discussions with some uh, member states, uh, um, as I said, about the details concerning the transmission, about tagging and, uh, and so on. Therefore, you will not find uh, that part uh, yet but uh, it can come at any moment as we are, uh, from the technical point of view, we are ready to, uh, to present it. Uh, I see that Gianfranco wanted to add something to this. Yes, I, I believe that the question may also refer to uh, how some of the high value data sets are actually a point of contact with what uh, on the DSCC side we call the blueprint, because many, uh, most member states will publish as high value data sets what are commonly referred to as reference data. Uh, reference data, practically, are data sets describing the real world, like could be the list of cities, the list of streets uh, per city, uh, the list of cities per country, and so on. And those are super useful for uh, interoperability and, and integration of data sets because they remove ambiguity uh, when you need to cross uh, different data sets describing the same phenomenon. Typically for addresses, for example, I may write my home address in putting the house number at the end. A British person may put the house number at the beginning, but they are exactly the same place. Uh, reference data on the um, dataeuropa.eu uh, side are actually data sets being published and redistributed, findable through uh, dataeuropa.eu. In the blueprint, most likely, like vocabularies, data, reference data will be described as an element of uh, data integration. Uh, at the moment, they are not yet in the blueprint. There is a proposal to consider them part of uh, what we call uh, the data interoperability building block in the data model section. Uh, we were actually literally discussing this two days ago in Brussels uh, with many colleagues from the commission. Uh, so uh, stay tuned because sooner or later we'll see that uh, reference data popping up in our blueprint as well. If I can just add um, to what Gianfranco said, because this is actually an, a very interesting topic where we also can offer um, expertise uh, in the publications office uh, of the European Union, um, and we where we build um, lots of reference data uh, and. Uh, uh, for example, uh, Eurovoc, probably quite some of you or some of you uh, heard about Eurovoc uh, as a, a thesaurus, um, which is again free to use uh, and reuse. And um, when it comes to the reference data, we, we can offer much more. Uh, and uh, if you would be at any moment uh, thinking about um, uh, 
uh, the needs and uh, and um, searching for the possibilities, please also contact us because, uh, of course, uh, even if this is not uh, strict Europe data Europe EU, we are the same service, uh, the publications office. Uh, therefore, we can put you in touch with the colleagues who are responsible for that. We will be uh, more than happy um, to do it. And Gianfranco already put the link. Um, uh, to Eurovoc, um, thank you for this. And um, for any other resources, uh, if you would have any um, uh, needs uh, identified uh, in relation to reference data, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you, Marcin. Thank you, Gianfranco. Um, so I move on to our next big question that's been asked in the chat uh, by Manuel which is, uh, do you in the DSCC manage some info around simple? If I understood well, the toolbox is expected to be aligned with the version 1.5 of the blueprint, that it's also connected and aligned with simple, but simple doesn't seem to start, does it? Uh, we have, so I'm not sure who wants to start taking this. Gianfranco, you can start. Yes, and then I can take from... it. Uh... So we, we sometimes joke say that the SSC is uh, Simple's uh, bigger sister, right? So, but it's too easy for us. We've been around for more than one year longer. Uh, and our colleagues that we are working with uh, almost every day at this point, although perhaps it's not that visible yet, uh, are finding their feet and, and preparing uh, to be much more visible as much as we are today. Um, Back to your question specifically, uh, of course, the toolbox is intended to be aligned with simple and it's almost obvious in a way, you, you probably could guess in what way without me telling you. On one side, uh, the, uh, the simple colleagues will uh, submit to us their own choices of software because it would be silly otherwise. Why wouldn't our catalog, what we call the toolbox, not list the technology choices of simple itself. Uh, on the other side, uh, the, um, the toolbox will also uh, document the choices of simple, and uh, but we also extend it. I don't want to cover something that Michael and, and uh, Sonia in the room perhaps can, can take, that is uh, the, the toolbox will be a bit wider in scope uh, because we want also to learn from commercial solutions where simple has a uh, mandate to only use open source software, for example. So there is alignment, and in an ideal world, you would be able to move from one to the other seamlessly. Uh, that's our ambition. Uh, Sonia, I saw you in video. Perhaps you want to add something. Yeah, no, you explained it perfectly. Um, differences we will have not only open source software in there, and we will not only have technical implementations in the toolbox, I mean. Um, that will be the difference, but of course we want to align as much, much as possible with simple. Uh, one of the alignments is what Michi described about the components that we have defined in the DSSC, so that we are aligned with the components that simple define. Um, and that's why um, we'll see in, in the coming iterations of the blueprint, um, this, this alignment. Thanks, Sonia. And Simple has started, by the way. <laughs> They're working with us already. So it's just a matter, perhaps, of not being as loud as we are. Back to you, Anna. Yeah, thank you, Gianfranco. Thank you, Sonia, for stepping in. Uh, there is another question in the chat, uh, which is also from Stefano Bonfau, who's asking, how can the DSCC be used in the digital program opportunities related to data space? Um, I can take it again, if yeah, you like. You <laughs> yes, so the um, at the moment, the SSC has a sort of an advisory role with respect to the Digital Europe program. Um, we are uh, providing this kind of guidance that we are also researching, collecting from all of you, the ones of, among you who are projects uh, funded by the EU, to return back to the same community. But the SSC does not have a sort of a... Uh, kind of, we, we don't uh, validate with a stamp uh, what uh, data spaces do uh, and so on. At the same time, it, it, it goes without saying that if a new proposal for an upcoming grant or procurement in this space can claim to have been contributing to data space support center or to be aligned with our guidance, uh, you, will, you will win brownie points, I would say, because inevitably, of course, the 
uh, our friends at the Commission will appreciate that. But at the moment, it's only it's only soft power. Let's say the one we ex we exercise. We don't. We are not in any way discriminating, or we don't have any power to judge a good data space there and a bad data space there. Uh, this may change in in the future. Still, perhaps anyway, leaving some a lot of room for for wiggling, let's say that the, none of us, I believe, can claim to have the recipe for the perfect data space. None of us wants to, uh, has the arrogance to, to assume we do. Um, so uh, long story short, um, if you follow our guidance, uh, you will get closer to the way that uh, the European Commission think of and expect of data spaces that may be the short version. Thank you. Thank you, Gianfranco. Uh, I see there is no other question in the chat. Usually when I say this, question starts popping up, so I will leave <laughs> a couple of extra minutes. Uh, but for for the moment, I invite so I invite you to sign up uh, to the GDSC newsletter. You see the slide, the QR code in the slide. So then you can always be up to date with what we do or what the next webinar will be. You can also we can. Uh, get in touch with all the technicals, uh, technical updates and requests for events or what, what we're doing with the community, all sorts of uh, all sorts of requests. You will we'll get to know more about us through the newsletter. Uh, on this note, uh, I am very happy to thank you, thank all the speakers to this to, to, for taking part in this webinar. Thank you, Sonia, Michiel, thank you, Elena and Marcin. Uh, we hope that uh, our audiences are appreciated as much as we did and we will uh, we will sure um we will meet to them during the next uh, inside series appointment and so thank you also for our audience and we wish you a good evening and uh, goodbye thank you all thank you goodbye. Bye. Thank, thank you, you. bye bye